My lab um, focuses on the mechanisms that underlie mood disorders and drug addiction. And we particularly focus on bipolar disorder um, and essentially trying to learn how bipolar disorder develops and how we can design better treatments for this disorder um, that uh, will hopefully help a lot of people. And one of the, um, the key systems that we're really interested in is uh, that, that controls, the system that controls circadian rhythms. Uh, so circadian rhythms um, are prominent in, um, they basically are our 24-hour rhythms that control um, pretty much everything in our body. Um, everything that we do, of course, revolves around a 24-hour cycle, a light-dark cycle. And as you can see here, um, the, the biggest thing that people usually associate with circadian rhythms is sleep. So our sleep and wake cycle is, is controlled over 24 hours, uh, but also blood pressure, um, body temperature, alertness, coordination, all of these things happen over a 24-hour cycle. And it's been known for many, many years that people with mood disorders, and particularly bipolar disorder, have uh, severe disruptions in sleep, severe disruptions in their circadian cycle. A lot of people tend to be night owls. They're, um, they're sort of shifted to the nighttime as their preference. And changes in schedule, um, if somebody uh, flies overseas or they work a different shift or something like this, it can set them off into a mood episode. More often than anything else, this is what sets them off, is, is some sort of change in schedule. So we're very interested in the role of the circadian system in, um, in how it controls mood, how it controls reward, and these sorts of things. Um, and this led us towards a path um, for, um, for de the design of better treatments as well, which is what our IMRO um, grant is focused on. So I'm just going to give you an example of, um, of how rhythms can be disrupted in, uh, in people with bipolar disorder. So this is a normal person's activity rhythm. So basically, they measure this by putting a watch on that measures their activity over 24 hours. And each of these is a different day. And you can see the black bars is uh, when somebody's awake and moving around. And where it's uh, quiet there is when the person is sleeping. And you can see in this normal person, they have uh, very regular sleep-wake patterns, um, which is really good to see because we know that disruption in circadian rhythms really can cause a, a lot of problems. And this is what a person in mania might look like. So this is actually a subject um, who is off medication who um, was experienced mania. And you can see, instead of having that regular period of sleep and wake, they tend to just be awake for long periods, even days and then maybe crashing into a phase of, of sleeping and then right back at it. So this is just one example of how rhythms can be very, very disrupted in, um, in people with bipolar disorder. Now, I'm a mouse doctor. I don't, I don't see patients. And so um, <laughs> we, <laughs> we wanted to know um, if we tested mice that had a disruption in circadian rhythms and a disruption in one of the core genes that is controlling circadian function, this is a gene called clock, what would happen to the mice? What would these mice look like? Would they resemble anything close to bipolar disorder? And what we found was that these mice really look remarkably like patients, uh, specifically when they're in the manic phase. So these mice are very hyperactive. They sleep less than wild-type mice. They have less depression-related behavior in a number of animal models. Uh, they have lowered levels of anxiety, so these are big risk-taking mice. They like to be out doing dangerous things. And they're more sensitive to the rewarding effects of pretty much everything. So food, sugar, cocaine, alcohol, you name it, these mice love it. So <laughs> these guys are really, they're every way that we could test them, they really look very, very similar to bipolar patients in this manic state. And this turns out to be the most well-described model to date of human mania. And it really gives us a tremendous opportunity to not only figure out why they're acting like this, what's causing this manic-like phenotype, but also we can use them to look at treatments, to, to screen for um, potential new treatments, to figure out how some of the old treatments work. Lithium has been around for about 60 years. Nobody knows how it works. So we, uh, we can really use these mice to our advantage to look for, um, for promising new treatments that, that, can, that can then go into the clinic and someday be used um, for people suffering with this disorder. And when we gave these mice lithium, um, after seeing their behavioral phenotypes, 
we realized that lithium um, actually restored them uh, to wild-type mice. So this validates this as a great model in which to test new drugs. Now, I wanted to tell you a little bit about how we um, came up with the um, specific proteins that we're targeting for our MRO grant in, um, in terms of a new treatment for bipolar disorder. And there, how we got there was basically looking at what does the clock gene do. So the clock gene is a protein, it encodes for a protein that regulates the expression of other genes. So it controls a lot of gene expression in the body, uh, most of them in a rhythmic fashion over 24 hours. And, um, and we know that the ability of the clock gene to function is based on how accessible the DNA is to this protein. So all of us in every single cell have meters of DNA that we have to package inside little cells. So this DNA is wound around proteins called histones. And then these histones are compacted even more tightly into eventually uh, chromosomes, which you might be used to seeing. And these proteins like clock can only function if the DNA is open, if there's a little bit of space for that um, protein to come in there and activate transcription or activate gene expression. If the DNA is closed, it can't do that. So we knew that this was a mechanism that might be important in the regulation of, of how um, clock was working and, um, and what sort of genes it was regulating. So one example of a gene that is, is regulated by clock is a gene called CCK. And this is a peptide that's involved in feeding, it's involved in reward, anxiety, a very important peptide in the brain. And one of the things we found with the clock mutant mice was that they had very low levels of CCK. So that clock protein was not able to activate the expression of this gene. But when we gave them lithium, this brought CCK back up to normal. So this suggested to us that this was maybe a very important change that was happening in response to lithium in these mice to make the mice um, more like normal mice. And we also um, wanted to know if this, there were similar changes occurring in the brains of bipolar patients. So we took post-mortem brains from people with bipolar disorder or normal controls, and we looked at levels of CCK in patients that were either with medication at the time of death or off medication at the time of death. And we found that they really looked very, very similar to the mice. So they had the people who were off medication had a low level of CCK, the people that were on medication had restored levels of CCK. So again, lithium or other medications is doing something to help um, rescue this expression of CCK in, uh, in a disease state, both in the mice and in the people. So it turns out that one of the ways that you can change the structure of this DNA is through um, proteins called HDACs. So HDACs are proteins that when they're around, the DNA becomes more tightly wound and, and these, these proteins like clock are not able to get in. But when the HDACs are inhibited, then you can get more relaxed DNA and these proteins can come in and, and they can bind and they can activate gene expression. So we thought this might be a good place to look for a therapeutic target. Um, it turned out that HDAC exhibitors already existed and I'll tell you about a few of them. And so this was a good place to start where maybe we could use this as a way to, to create a new therapy for bipolar disorder. And the other reason we thought HDACs might be, um, might be interesting to look at and why HDAC inhibitors might be um, particularly important is because another drug that's used to treat bipolar disorder, valproic acid or uh, Depakote, we know that it has some um, ability to inhibit HDACs, although it does a whole lot of other things too. So we didn't know if this was really the th what's, what's causing its therapeutic, therapeutic efficacy. But so we wanted to look at, um, at Valproate, and we also wanted to look at some more specific HDAC inhibitors that were really only targeting these HDAC proteins. And luckily for us, there's a number of them that have been um, have been synthesized, and they're actually FDA approved in the use for cancer. So when you inhibit HDACs, um, it generally leads to the death of cancer cells. And so there's a number of drugs that are now on the market um, specifically for cancer. But we thought maybe these will be good treatments for bipolar disorder. So we tested uh, Valproate, and we also tested SAHA, which is one of the leading HDAC inhibitors that's used in therapy today. We wanted to see if this would rescue 
the behavioral phenotypes of our mice. And I'm not going to go into all the details of how we test whether a mouse is anxious or a mouse is depressed, but you'll have to believe me that we can tell. <laughs> we can tell how the mice are, are feeling to some extent. Uh, we can't ask them, obviously, but we, we do the best we can. So um, what we found was that valproate and Saha were just as good as lithium at reversing the behavioral um, abnormalities of the clock mutant mice. So here this is showing in tests of anxiety that Valpro-8 was rescuing and um, causing the, the clock mutant mice to look like normal mice. And importantly, it was having very little effect on the wild type mice, on the normal mice. So this is something good. This is something you want to see in a potential new therapy is it doesn't really affect normal mice so much. And we also looked at measures of depression-related behavior. So we, uh, we also found a similar effect. It was able to completely restore um, normal levels of depression-related behavior in these mice. So this is very exciting because it suggests that these are really novel drugs that could potentially be, um, be used in the clinic someday to treat bipolar disorder. Now, HDAC inhibitors are not perfect. And there's um, a lot of reasons why you might not want to use them. They have a lot of side effects. And uh, maybe for cancer treatment, this is OK. It's a short-term treatment. It's, uh, it's not something someone's going to be taking for the rest of their life. Um, but for psychiatric diseases, maybe the, the current HDAC inhibitors are not the best. So um, what we want to do with, um, with the funds that MRO is providing us is to try to find which are the HDAC proteins that are the ones that we really want to target and the ones we really want to hit with the therapy and leave the others alone. So then maybe we wouldn't have so many side effects that you would get with the current um, HDAC inhibitors that are out there. So we're planning to test a drug, um, MS275, which is another HDAC inhibitor, but it's much more specific than SAHA. So hopefully that one will have, um, will have just the same therapeutic effect. Uh, we'll see. Um, and we're also using a genetic trick that's um, very similar to gene therapy, where we're knocking down um, the expression of these HDACs one by one in the mouse's brain to see which one is leading to our therapeutic effect. Now, I'm not saying we are eventually wanting to use this for gene therapy, um, although that would be a possibility. But rather, if we find the, um, the HDAC protein that's the one that we really want to target, then we could create um, a chemical that would inhibit just that HDAC and not the whole host of others. And of course, you know, eventually uh, we would like to take this into some sort of therapy um, if, if it all works out in the mice. Uh, we also feel like um, circadian rhythm, um, there are a lot of drugs that are, are coming on board from different pharmaceutical companies. Um, different academic collaborators that um, modify circadian rhythms in specific ways. And these are also drugs we're very excited about. We've been testing in our mice. And we think that they also have a lot of potential to be, again, completely novel, completely new types of drugs that we can use for the treatment of bipolar disorder. So I want to thank Imro um, and, these are, and the members of my lab who, um, who do the work. <laughs> <laughs> And you can see we're very happy to be in Pittsburgh and uh, the rest of our funding also, which, is, uh, which has been great. So thank you very much.